Welcome to the Future Thinkers Podcast, episode number 64. Today is just Mike and I, and we're talking about sovereignty, specifically individual sovereignty and sovereignty of mind. So we talk about what that is, what it means to us personally. We talk about some of our own stories of our path towards gaining more sovereignty in our lives and our failures and successes with it. And then we share some ideas and techniques and exercises that people can try for themselves to gain more sovereignty in their lives. One thing that I wanted to mention before we get into this is that sovereignty is a really personal thing. You can't really tell somebody how to be free. So although we're making these suggestions or telling these stories, really, this is what sovereignty means to us. This is how we've done it. This is how we've applied it to our lives. And it might look really different for you. But we hope that this at least opens some doors and provides some ideas of what it could look like. And if you want the links or mentions for this episode, go to futurethinkers.org slash 64. This episode is brought to you by Qualia, a premium nootropic supplement that helps support mental performance and brain health. It's specifically designed to promote focus, support energy, mental clarity, mood, memory, and creativity. UV and I have both used it in the past. We really like it. And we actually met the founders and interviewed them on Future Thinkers. And you can check out those interviews. They're one of our favorites at futurethinkers.org slash Daniel and futurethinkers.org slash Jordan. They've got a new formula up called Qualia Mind. It's got more natural ingredients and you can get it at futurethinkers.org slash brain hack and you can get 10% off if you use the code future. All right, let's get into the show. Welcome to futurethinkers.org, a podcast about the evolution of technology, society, and consciousness. I'm Mike Gilliland. And I'm Yuvi Ivanova. If you're new to the show and you'd like a list of our top episodes and resources, go to futurethinkers.org slash start. And if you like our podcast, leave us a rating and a review on iTunes and elsewhere. It really helps others find the show and we really appreciate it. Hey guys, all right, today we have just a Mike and Yuvi episode. We're going to be talking about sovereignty today. It's been a pretty important subject for both of us for quite a long time due to the fact that we have kind of escaped the old Western cultural familial occupational scripts and we're like venturing off doing our own thing in Bulgaria, working online and kind of like burning all of those old scripts. So sovereignty is actually a pretty important topic to us. So that's what we want to talk about today. And we decided to start with talking about sovereignty of mind because it all starts with your mindset and kind of ends with your mindset too. It's a bit of a loop thing. So why don't we start with talking about what sovereignty is to each of us personally? What does it mean to you, Mike? Well, I think we should cover the definition first. So basically, to me, the capacity to be the exclusive control of your own body, your mind and your life, that's essentially what sovereignty is. Like you are in control. You are aware of all the options on the menu and off the menu. To that, I would add is having a capacity to make sense of what is actually happening around you and then make choices or decisions accordingly. So on a personal level, for me, I think sovereignty became a really important thing, probably when I was wrapped up in a carpet when I was a little kid, (laughs) just playing around with my brother and his friend, and they wrapped me up in a carpet. We thought it would be a funny thing. And then all of a sudden, I realized how trapped and claustrophobic I was immediately and freaked out. And that kind of point just sticks out in my mind for some reason is like a significant thing, even though, you know, sovereignty for me is played out in a lot of other ways. But never being trapped has been that big lesson and motivation out of that. After that, it was all about not wanting to do what I was recommended to do as far as occupation, and you know, career choices, that sort of stuff. It was like I was always recommended to go work as a rig worker and like drill for oil and stuff because <laughs> of probably my performance levels in school, <laughs> which coincides with my attendance level, which is about 50 percent. So, you know, like. They just kind of view you as that problem kid and eh, you should go drill oil. That's about all you're good for. I never wanted to do that. And I basically figured out how to self-teach and self-learn. And that became a very important thing for me to basically use the internet to learn whatever I wanted to learn that wasn't really being taught in schools and wasn't really on the menu of career options for me. So I kind of paved my own way through reading books, watching YouTube videos, that sort of thing. And probably one of the biggest things that stood out to me is the options that were available when I went looking for them on my own, as opposed to what was kind of prescribed by family and professionals and that sort of thing while I was growing up. So how about you? What's the personal significance of sovereignty for you? Well, in my case, I 
did pretty well in school as a kid. I was creative, but I succeeded in the traditional schooling system. And that was actually a, a bit of a detriment in the long run because I stayed believing in that system for a very long time and I ended up going to university. And even though within that university structure, I chose more less conservative subjects, but I still followed that idea that I could go somewhere in life by getting a university degree. And then only much later did I realize that I can't and I would have been better off just finding my own path from an earlier age and not wasting time and money on university. Because if you want to break the mold, then following the mold is not going to get you very far. Yeah, I love how many people prescribe the mold to do something different or express yourself or to kind of break free. It's like really not the way it works. Yeah. And so that was a, a big realization for me that if you want to do something extraordinary, there is no map. You have to make your own map. Yeah, that's a good point. What was it that you said to me earlier today about having some sort of structure of the map, but being comfortable to then alter the path along the way once you've already started? Yeah. So today I was thinking a lot about right-brained and left-brained rationality and how they're different. And of course, there are some people who are able to use both. And I think that's definitely a really, really useful skill. But for the most part, people kind of rely on, on one or the other hemisphere. And so I was thinking about how it would be possible to combine the rationality of left-brained thinking and right-brained thinking. So the rationality and goal setting in the left brain is basically you decide on a goal that you want. It's usually something tangible, doable. And then you deconstruct it into steps, resources, things you need to do, you know, timelines, this kind of very specific structure. And then you just execute on the structure. Right-brained way of making goals and, and making sense of the world is more like you envision something wild and ridiculous that has never been thought of before, and then you follow signs, hunches, intuition, creative urges in order to go down the road towards achieving it. And so, of course, when you think about doing something really extraordinary, you can see how using a combination of those two paths would be probably the best because the right-brained one is so unstructured that you can get lost or you can lose energy halfway through. And the left-brained one by itself can be very rigid. And if something unexpected happens, or if you're actually trying to go off the map and create something new, there are certain points at which it stops being useful and you have to be willing to drop your map or hold it very lightly and recognize that it might be inaccurate or that you might have to redraw the map halfway through your voyage. So that's kind of a, a synchronized two-hemisphere form of rationality and goal setting. And I think that people have the capacity to use both hemispheres. I mean, why else would they be there? But the way that we are trained in school and by parents and by society is a lot more linear. And I think that this might just be a cultural thing. Like Western culture has succeeded on this kind of thinking, so it has become recursive. You know, it teaches people that this is what works rather than this is one of the methods that can work. So I want to swing back to sovereignty of mind again and talk about the menu of options that are typically kind of handed to you in culture, your family, education, career choices, that sort of thing. So how can you actually know what choices are available to you outside of what is commonly presented? That's a really good question. And actually, that's a right-brained activity because you have to go off the map of what is known. And you have to imagine things that are not known and, and make connections that maybe haven't been made before. Or even if you're not making it up yourself, you have to think of where would you have to look to find those other options? Because in all likelihood, other people would have come up with something else and you can get ideas. So I think that's actually an easier way to do it than invent something completely from scratch. You can just start looking for less common scripts. Pretty much you have access to the stories of anyone, any kind of style of life that you could possibly imagine just by Googling. Reading books, reading biographies of people who've done really extraordinary things, who did something really different, I think is really useful. And also because it shows you how they think a lot of the time or shows you their life path, how many times they failed, you know, how many times they've had to restart or went bankrupt or they had to change direction. And it shows you that it's not a linear path like we are often told it is. So accepting failure, I think, is a really big part of sovereignty as well. Understanding that it's part of life. You have a lot to say on this subject. I actually would like to hear your commentary on learning resilience and accepting failure. Definitely 
not being so academic and kind of traditionally career minded has influenced my sort of drive into entrepreneurship. And once you start on that, like relying on yourself and your wits and, and your ability to produce revenue and make sure bills are paid and, and innovate and come up with something that is actually a value that people want. That's the real struggle. And it's easy to get caught up in like all of the sort of get rich quick things or different schemes out there on the internet that are like some quick business idea, like Amazon affiliate or whatever. Like there's tons of different examples. I won't get into that. But I think really just recognizing that it's all dependent on you and that you've got to make it work. First of all, that sets the bar a lot higher for what you think and what you can achieve uh, because the bar is never really that high in sort of a job setting as far as the pressure goes. Like you've always got the company to fall back on. When it's you out there alone, you've got nothing to fall back on. Hopefully, maybe a bit of money saved or something like that. So that sort of like starve or figure it out mentality makes you stronger. And then if you're just fully committed to that lifestyle, then, you know, sometimes you starve and it sucks and you just get used to that. Um, well, you don't really get used to it because you're never comfortable with it. You just sort it out in the moment and you always figure something out after. I think for some people, like failing once is enough to just crush them. And I think that's where the mind game stuff comes in. Like if you're not mentally resilient, if you're not expecting that you're going to be doing this, whether it's working or not, and instead like money and security is a very high priority for you, then probably entrepreneurship is never going to be a real option unless you succeed the first try, which is nearly impossible. So yeah, as far as resilience goes, it's just basically like the only option if you're committed enough to your goal, from my experience. I think that's also the case with other aspects of sovereignty as well, because it is that walking in chaos path where you have to be comfortable with whatever comes. You have to be comfortable with failure or to be completely confused and not know what's going on. To be self-reliant. Yes, to be self-reliant. And it's kind of a paradox, but I think a part of sovereignty is being comfortable losing your sovereignty and yeah. knowing when you lose it. The options go up, I would say, the longer you're at it. Like when you're first starting, your options are very low because you probably don't have a lot of money and you know you might get invited out to hang out with friends, but your business is calling and you have to get something done, deal with a client, deal with a malfunctioning product or bad shipments or something like that. So that's all like, that all plays a role. But I've been thinking about this, actually. I've realized that the more freedom you have, the more responsibility you have to take. And this is not obvious to people sometimes because they imagine if they don't have a lot of sovereignty, if they don't have a lot of freedom, they imagine freedom being this kind of careless, childlike thing where they can just go do whatever they want and nobody can tell them what to do. And it's all just la 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 la, frolicking in the field and drinking martinis on the beach and partying. And Freedom's in the jungle. Yeah. Freedom is being airdropped into a jungle and surviving. Exactly. It means you could get killed any moment. And so you have to take responsibility for your domain of control. First of all, you have to determine what is your domain of control. And then you have to take full responsibility for it. Because when you are on your own, when you're making sovereign decisions, you can't make excuses anymore. You can't blame your failures on your parents or your teachers or your boss or your wife or anybody else because you are making those decisions on your own. So you are the only one responsible for the outcome. Of course, we're not saying that your separate thing floating out that's not affected by other forces, but that's where the sense making comes in. So yes, there are other forces, but can you make sense of what is happening and pick the most optimal thing to do for your goal or your life purpose or whatever. But sometimes that means that you just simply don't have any options and you have to fail and you have to be prepared for that and accept it, accept responsibility for it, not blame, you know, the crypto markets or your business partner, your friends or your family who didn't encourage you enough or any number of reasons. Oh, I ran out of money. It's like, oh, what did I do that contributed to this failing? What can I do better next time? So what are some other elements of sovereignty of mind that we haven't talked about yet? There's a lot to be said about the ideas and belief structures that we use to build maps of the world. Sovereignty of mind also has to do with how do you choose to see the world? First of all, recognizing that the, it is a choice. The way that we perceive the world is not actually the way that the world is. 
that it's a constructed thing in your mind, that this is a way that your brain simply makes sense of the world. It creates all these stories, it creates all these concepts, and links them together in a way that resembles coherence, but actually is just a bunch of sensory data, and you could arrange it in any way you wanted, really. And that there might be better ways of arranging it, that there might be better maps or internal belief structures. So I think we've talked about a lot of this kind of stuff before in different terms. We've talked about law of attraction a bit or synchronicity or any of these kinds of things. And it's it's a related concept, actually, because it's what kind of maps or what kind of concepts or, or belief structures are you using to understand the world? And if you switch it out for something else, you might be seeing the world from a completely different perspective, which can actually be beneficial, more beneficial to what you're trying to accomplish. So I'm sure you have a lot to say on this, of altering your own belief systems. And you did a lot of this kind of work in your teen years, actually. So, Well, I mean, the resilience thing is one thing. And then the reality testing is another thing that I think is very important. And basically, you have this mantra in the back of your mind that's always asking, what is true? What is real? What is true? What is real? What is true? What is real? And when you ask that of enough things, or at least in my experience, when I've asked that about everything, I can't really come up with anything that is true. Is this microphone in my hand real? Is it actually provably real? Well, under the construction that this reality, this dimension that we find ourselves in is solid, is real, then yes, you could make a point. But I mean, so much hinges on the original thing, like the original foundational layer of reality. Is this reality not a simulation, not the matrix, not a hallucination? Is it a multidimensional thing? Is like what comes before the Big Bang, all of this stuff. So like, that's why that people make that joke. In order to make a pie from scratch, you must first create the universe. It's basically the same kind of idea. Like, what can you prove is true? I know, at least I have the insight that truth, there is truth, truth exists. But does anything else really exist? I don't know for sure. And I think being able to live in that gray area where you're comfortable not knowing and you're comfortable basically that any belief system that you have could be completely uprooted from under you and to be able to like be comfortable to be tripping up and in the air and in space in the void or to be comfortable enough to once again find your footing. I just think that it's a very important thing for resilience and mental sovereignty to not commit yourself to any belief systems. Absolutely. You know, so and that, I mean, I use the microphone as an example, but I mean, so many things like you have to get a job. Do you? Is that real? Do I have to get a job? Can I not be my own boss? I have to raise kids a certain way. You have to have a house that you own in the West. Can't raise kids as a digital nomad. Like that lifestyle doesn't produce stable, happy children. I don't know. You could probably come up with examples as well. but Yeah, I mean, there's lots. Politics is one that cracks me up all the time. It's like basically the human equivalent of apes throwing feces at each other. And people take it so seriously. And of course, serious things hinge on politics, but most of it is just a show. It's so ridiculous. And it's absurd to me that we, you know, I don't want to get into a big political discussion, but it is absurd to me that we have these sort of choices. It's never like something we're coming up with and we're electing from the bottom up. It's just like you've got these idea ideologies that you have to fit your entire identity into. And if it doesn't fit, then you just ram it in there and you make it fit. There's nothing like more than these two options. And to me, that's just a farce. That's not real. That's an illusion. And the fact that a whole system is built on this and not functioning properly is kind of, well, further adds to the idea that this is simply an illusion. To shortly continue on that political line, I mean, what about an AI-based decentralized voting system or a government system, that sort of thing? Like, What could you come up with that takes out the middleman of representative democracy and allows people to have a direct impact without it turning into like a, I don't know, what, what happens in those political systems when it's like a true democracy? It ends up being like 51% bullying 49%. You heard about that? No. Yeah, I might just be not describing it well, but it's like what happens in a real democracy is like the majority always wins, but the majority can be 51%. So like really half of your population is super pissed off with one thing and the other half of the population is controlling everything and able to just bully everyone else who's not the majority. So it's not really a good system of government. Oh, so you mean that is like an ultimately optimized democracy? It ends up being that? Yeah, it's horrible. Like, democracy is actually terrible. (laughs) 
Interesting. I haven't heard of that. Um, if you can think of the link to the resource, I would love to add that in the show notes. Yeah. I, I don't know. I can't remember where I heard it from, but it's basically just, you know, there's dictatorship, which is one extreme and then like a democracy where a direct democracy is just a giant clusterfuck because people can't make up their minds. They're not interested in voting. They're not experts. And then you get like populism is a huge issue. I'm obviously not an expert about that, so I won't continue there. Let's talk about belief systems a little bit deeper now and also about perception a little bit deeper. For those who are hearing this and are thinking, well, what do you mean belief systems can be altered? Isn't there some sort of scientifically verifiable truth? Like, isn't there some sort of an ultimate belief that I can have? Well, this is actually something that you can do in your own mind. You can deconstruct any belief system to see if it actually holds any weight. You could ask yourself, why do you believe that? And how can you verify it? And then how can you verify that thing? And then how can you verify that thing? And then when you go down, it's turtles all the way down. Basically, you can't verify anything. And you just get stuck in a recursive loop. And then eventually you bump up against the wall of your own perception. So there's information coming in through your sensory organs. But then your brain is creating this whole picture. It's filling in the gaps. So it's basically hallucinating most of what you perceive as your lived experience, this kind of holographic perception of reality that we have that is seamless and colorful and, and meaningful and it's overlaid with all these different LA concepts and structures that are non-physical. All of that is created in the brain. It's a complete construct. It's a beautiful construct, but it's a construct. It's not a reality. If you get down to what you can actually verifiably prove from firsthand experience is real, you get down to I am. That's basically it. That's the, the only thing that you can verifiably prove is that I exist. I was reading this book called uh, Homo, not Homo Deus. It's the other one. It was Sapiens. Sapiens. Yeah, Sapiens. And in that book, kind of close to the beginning, one of the most profound things I learned was how the real shift when we took off as a species and started dominating on the planet was when we invented fictions. Because inside the realm of fictions fits law, hierarchy, any kind of creative endeavor that then turns into physical endeavor. Like a corporations, that's a perfect example. Corporations are fictions. But when people allow for those fictions to be real and have actual autonomy and laws and things surrounding them, then you can actually make things happen in the real world collectively. But fiction is basically like the launching point of our civilization. I'm really glad you brought this up, actually, because I was thinking about this yesterday, how it seems that we have created a new dimension to reality, we as humans. And it is an internal dimension that exists in our brains collectively, in which we can do things abstractly without having a physical representation of it. Yeah, that happens all the time. We're really good at doing that. You've got virtual reality, you've got Facebook, your Facebook account, your persona online, your Instagram persona, like all of this stuff. You create fictions everywhere you go. Yeah, and you can create them with different sets of rules than what current physical reality has. So that's why I'm saying it's like a separate dimension. It's that for every individual person. They have their own dimension that they can create with their own set of rules, and then they can test that if it can be ported back into the physical dimension, if they can actually create something in the physical dimension based on what they discovered in this virtual dimension. So give me an example. You can create something in Photoshop and then use that design to create a physical thing. Oh, so like, a, you know, an architect. Yeah. Building plans and then have the building created. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Or you can use words as your dimension and you can deconstruct something logically with words to try to figure out what would happen in real life if this happened or if this happened or if this happened. You can even just talk to another person using words and kind of brainstorm different outcomes and get a different perspective and then understand what's going to happen in the physical world, what is likely to happen, unlikely to happen, or how you can collaborate to build something. So this is something very unique that humans do. And this is, I mean, it sounds pretty esoteric, but Humans are multidimensional creatures in that way. Even if you don't take quantum physics into account, which of course is significant, but even if you just use it as a symbolic thing, this dimension of abstract thinking has different rules in the physical dimension. 
we might as well treat it as a different dimension of reality. So where are you going with that? Well, that sovereignty is in part recognizing that the separate dimension of reality exists and that it is a dimension of reality of your own making. It's not just the sensory input that you are getting from the outside world. It's also what you are using that sensory input to construct. How do you connect all the different pieces of information that you're getting? And what can you build on top of it? So how do we kind of get back into more practical ways to either test sovereignty or test your own mental limitations or see what's off the menu as far as choice? Like, What are some sort of practical applications of this? There's a book called Prometheus Rising by Robert Anton Wilson, where he talks about kind of different dimensions of consciousness and human functioning. And he gives a lot of interesting exercises for how you can break out of your kind of robotic, habitual way of thinking. And one of the examples that he uses that is really simple is if you are, if you consider yourself a liberal, cut out all liberal media for a month and read the most conservative media you can find only. I really, really like that one. I love that advice. And that advice has always worked out for me so well to dive into something that either feels uncomfortable or feels counterintuitive or feels like the wrong thing, like the wrong idea, the wrong opinion, and just to learn about it, but without having to commit to your judgment about it either way. Just to immerse yourself in basically the enemy's position, if that's what you want to call it. Art of War actually talked about this quite a lot, about really getting to know the enemy. Uh, it doesn't have to be always in that oppositional way of thinking, but a willingness to like live with the enemy and learn the way they learn and learn the things that they know. Super valuable. Or if you're, for example, a very materialist person and you only consider hard science and hard logic, cut out all media that is in that realm for a month and immerse yourself in the wackiest, weirdest... Free-hugging hippie. (laughs) Free-hugging hippie, mysticism, spiritual shamanism weirdness that you can find. Or if you're completely wrapped up in that, learn about law. (laughs) Yeah. If you are a free-thinking hippie and you hate paperwork and you hate structure then immerse yourself into extreme structure for a month. Yeah. Why? (laughs) Well, first of all, you learn a different dimension to your being. You might pick up some useful tools. You might realize that you're actually really good at some things on the other side. And you might also realize that there are some really valid and useful ways of thinking on the other side. And then eventually you might realize that taking sides is just stupid. (laughs) Hopefully. (laughs) Hopefully that outcome is what they arrive at. (laughs) <laughs> More likely, they're going to learn how to better destroy their enemy. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but either way, it works mm-hmm. to your advantage. Yeah, so that's one thing. What kind of exercises have you done to get yourself kind of off of the map and into creative territory? Well, I'm definitely a very focused kind of mindset. Like, I will pick something I want to do, and I'll just keep hammering away at that thing until I've got it. So... I think the biggest limiter for me is just imagination. Like, how big do I want to go? But I think that's definitely just doable. It's very mechanical. I think that's doable for anyone. Just, I don't know, open up your mind. Think of what you ideally want. Look for other people who are doing that thing. And then break it down into milestones and steps. And then just chip away at it every day. That's pretty much like there's no magic to it. That's actually for people who might be living in a very habitual lifestyle and can't really think of anything that they might want to do that is outside of that, but something in them is yearning for it, just study biographies of different kinds of people. Just read biographies of very varied types of people, and you might get ideas for what you could be doing. Just see that there are other scripts available. And even if you're not inventing something completely your own, at least you might get an idea of what kind of path might be more fulfilling to you. One thing that has worked really well for me and has been a really difficult thing in the past has been to learn how to sit with my thoughts and not respond to them. So being that I have had all this heightened anxiety about being an entrepreneur and not having any safety net and traveling around and this kind of like crazy stuff that we do, I have had these sort of like high anxiety moments where I I feel like I've got to be productive, I've got to be doing something, I've got to be, you know, making use of every minute of the day. And actually, that's extremely detrimental to your mental health 
to be chasing after things all the time and learning how to just sit with that discomfort of knowing your body or the monkey just wants to like get up and do something has been extremely beneficial because then the real inspiration and the solutions and creative solutions for these problems come up like a much higher level than what you're looking at them from the day-to-day consciousness level. We can transition into talking about meditation a bit more here. So that's one of the exercises that you can do in meditation is you can observe your own mind. What is it doing? If there are looping thoughts, what are they about? So it's your prefrontal cortex. Its function is to make sense of things and to conclusively decide that things are something. It makes concepts really well. And so if there's an unresolved problem, according to the prefrontal cortex, that thing will keep going on and on 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 loop in your head until it's solved. So if you can quiet the mind, if you can bring your attention to your breath or your body, and if you can shut up that loop of thoughts, then you're immersed in four billion years of evolutionary wisdom that you carry in your genes. And there are creative solutions, there are different perspectives, there are other ways of looking at things. And of course, there's just tranquility so that your body can rest for a while. I think there's just like you said at the beginning of this conversation when basically that our culture enforces this sort of logical way of thinking. I think we have a bit of a heightened hubris about our ability to solve all problems with logical thinking. We really think that's the way that anything gets done and solved. And I myself am extremely guilty of that in the past of thinking like everything is a puzzle to be solved because that's the way I think. I like puzzles. Everything is just fill in the gaps of knowledge until you understand the thing fully and then it can be deconstructed. But actually, I've learned over time that sometimes just shutting the monkey mind up, shutting up the logical mind, all of that stuff, and just being completely void of thought that these solutions, the most ideal, optimal solution just pops into my head without any effort or focus whatsoever. That's been like a continuing lesson I have to remind myself of because I'm so habituated to solving problems with very like strategic, focused thinking, and it's not always necessary. And it doesn't help that you're actually skilled at it. So you generally get good results with that problem-solving mind, but sometimes with overuse, it definitely just causes more anxiety. For example, I might make a massive Trello board with like a thousand checklists and each card and have this really detailed process when just giving someone like a three (laughs) sentence piece of instruction on what to do and then they can go off and solve it themselves in their own way. It's like actually much more efficient and intelligent to just do the simple version. Actually, the reason why meditation is so good for the mind is that and they've shown this in, in lots of studies, that it, it synchronizes your whole nervous system. So without meditation in our world that is full of distractions and high pressure and a lot of you're being pulled in a million different directions, your brain is like an orchestra before the concert starts. So everybody's practicing their own thing. It sounds like a cacophony. It's terrible. Instruments are out of tune. That's what your brain is doing normally. And they actually measure it in terms of like percentage of brain synchronization when they do these studies. And I think most people are at like 30%. So it's really bad, really not optimal. And then when people get into these deep meditative states, especially as they get more skilled at meditation, they can increase their brain synchronization to 60, 70, 80, 90, 95% for some really you know, experienced meditators. That's why you come up with optimal solutions and things that you haven't thought about before and kind of new perspectives is because you're using your whole nervous system, everything, your limbic brain, you know, your neocortex, your prefrontal cortex, your sensory networks of skin and your gut brain and everything is working in sync. And there's a lot of wisdom in that, which often gets forgotten, I think, in these kinds of urban Western societies where people get really cut off from the wisdom of their physical body. And a lot of diseases actually come from that because people are just not listening to their body. They're stuck in their head and feeding their body with sugar and alcohol and caffeine and all these different things that are numbing it all the time. They're not even getting the message. But if you can just sit and shut off your mind for a bit and just learn to listen to the body, it helps everything. 
cannabis has actually been a really important tool for me in that respect of like just sitting back and listening to the body for once. Like so many weeks go by if I don't do it, months often, and this tension kind of builds up in the back of my neck and my joints will start aching. And and I'll realize after just taking a little bit of cannabis that I'm tensing up in certain areas of my body or I haven't stretched in quite a while or I'm like not feeding myself properly, like everything just kind of floats to the surface, what I'm ignoring with my own body. So that's been a really helpful tool. I think actually plant medicines are generally a really amazing tool for reconnecting with the body and with the limbic system and some deeper unconscious as well. We've talked about some of them before. I find another really, really good method is to immerse yourself in nature. Cut out all stimulants like sugar, alcohol. I know alcohol is a depressant, but any kinds of like chemical interference in your body, obviously any kinds of drugs, cut all of that out and immerse yourself in nature and cut out media and preferably have a bit more solitude, like you know, not in the big group. That in itself, even if you're not doing any kind of meditation, that in itself immerses you into a whole different dimension of your sensory experience and subconscious, that is really, really useful. I agree. It is useful to kind of make a big leap or bound in one direction or many directions in your life. But whether or not it's sustainable after that experience is really a big question mark for a lot of people. For me, it's like I can never really tell if one of those meditation retreats or ayahuasca experiences or anything is going to have this like long lasting effect on me afterwards. If I don't bring to my life, some sort of integration of those lessons. And like that really just comes down to habit and hard decision making about what you're doing with your day. As far as like I'm concerned, though, probably the biggest thing that's ever, ever had an effect on my mental clarity, my ambition is uh, meditating twice a day. That has been like massively powerful. And I've only done it a couple of times and for short periods of time. But when I did do that, just everything changed. So meditating early in the morning, first thing, and then again, you know, in the afternoon, three or 4 p.m. or even sometimes earlier, depending on how early you get up. But that sort of like breakup of the day has been just massive. It's almost like I get two full days in one. That's how transcendental meditation works too. It's all like focused mantra meditation, like you focus on an object for 10 minutes. I'm not sure if they do the open awareness one after that, but I'm pretty sure it's mostly just mantra, but you do it twice a day. And that's why everyone rants and raves about TM is because it's one of the only practices that requires you to do it twice a day and break it up, break up your day. And I didn't even think about that when I was meditating more frequently, but that's exactly the, where the benefit comes in is that second time that you do it. For me, I got the best results when I was meditating really a lot. Mm -hmm. But that's not really available to everyone. I know it's harder to for people to find the time, but I just wanted to share my own experience that for people who do have that time flexibility, I was meditating one to three hours a day, every day for over a year. And before that and after that, I was still meditating every day, but, you know, not quite such a long stints. And that's when I was making really, really rapid progress. And then at that point, the most difficult thing becomes the integration because you're getting a lot of brain change very rapidly and you're getting a lot of insights really rapidly. And then what do you do with all of that physical restructuring and and information as well? It's really the big question. So it's been actually really good that we're both doing this kind of in parallel and we've done it a bit asynchronously. Like sometimes there were big chunks of time when you were doing more meditation or I was doing more meditation, but we had each other to bounce off of. And I think that's been really valuable to share experiences and it it helps for integration. I think going back to what we originally talking about with sovereignty, about having choice of your day, like if you're an entrepreneur and you're on your own versus if you are working a career and you've got a 40 or 50 hour work week, that sort of thing, there's actually not a lot of time to do any real thinking for yourself and to develop yourself outside of that job. But in sort of the entrepreneurial lifestyle or with some of those jobs that give you a little bit more free time, you can take the time to learn. And for me, audiobooks have been really key to like my constant progress because actually you're going to feel lazy and just not up to it. Like you don't want to be productive every day, every hour of every day. But in those lazy chill out moments where you could be watching YouTube or Netflix or 
you know, TV, something like brainless, you could actually be listening to audiobooks and developing. And it still gives you that dopamine hit of entertainment, but you're actually picking something up from it. That's been like incredibly powerful for me over the years. Yeah, actually, I wanted to extend also my comment about having each other to bounce off of and share experiences with. I think finding finding the others, as Timothy uh, Leary yeah. said, find the others. So in this case, it means find the people who are investigating the deeper nature of reality, who are investigating sovereignty, who are you know going off the map, who are trying to do something different outside of the box. Find those people because they might have some knowledge, some wisdom that they've gained along their path. And also it makes you feel not alone. You're able to connect with people on on a different level. Not to say that it's like some elitist thing, like, oh, I'm on a different level. It's just, it's a different headspace that you can enter together with people. And it's very positive when you're not the only one doing it, because then it helps erase self-doubt or any kind of weird feeling. Or, you know, if you're not sure that you're going crazy or you're, you know, doing this stuff and you feel, you know, on your own, basically alone and not safe in it, finding the others is really beneficial. I think we pretty much covered what we wanted to talk about today. So do you have anything else you want to say? That's probably it. I think that's a really good point to end it on. Cool. So we'll wrap it up here. If you want to check out any of the links or mentions from this episode, you can go to futurethinkers.org slash 64. All right, that's it, guys. And we will continue on this topic in another episode, I'm sure. If you're new to the show and you'd like a list of our top episodes and resources, go to futurethinkers.org slash start. If you want to sponsor our show, go to futurethinkers.org slash sponsor. If you like our podcast, leave us a rating and a review on iTunes and elsewhere. It helps others find the show, and we really appreciate it. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye! Bye.